your genius move is dying. Not a great plan. We might not have thought this through. Welcome to Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy. Justice League and The Avengers are very similar movies. Now, I'm not the first person to point this out. This isn't even the first video we've made about this. But I think there's one scene in each movie that shows why one film is a landmark achievement in movie history. Yes! And the other film was received like this. But before I get to that scene, let's discuss the movie's many similarities. First, Joss Whedon was called in to rewrite each film and ended up directing all or a huge chunk of the movie. Each movie also dealt with behind the scenes production problems like the recasting of Bruce Banner and the soft firing of Zack Snyder. Earth is defenseless after a godlike character has left the planet. Two villains with horn helmets arrive via a beam of light and they're after space cubes that have been hidden on Earth for centuries and were hidden by gods. The villain's goal is to use the box to conquer the Earth with an alien army. The heroes are unprepared for this threat, so the hero who first encountered the alien begins to recruit a team. Now, the characters in these movies parallel one another in a variety of ways. There's not one analog for Wonder Woman or Iron Man, so we're gonna mix and match these a bit. First up, they recruit a super-powered person with an ax to grind. The woman hero is introduced fighting a group of evildoers and then is sent to recruit a character who sees himself as a monster. Each of these men obtain their powers through a science experiment gone wrong. Both are essential to tracking down the space cubes and they each have trouble controlling their powers. The heroes gather information from the journals of a non-powered person, Lex Luthor and Howard Stark. Two of these heroes have fought in a world war and lost someone that they loved. Another hero has powers integrated with technology and a chest light even shines through his clothing. They each use holograms to learn about the other heroes. And also, two heroes are non-powered billionaires with an array of gadgets at their disposal. Two heroes are gods who have ancient ties to the villain and their love interests are quickly given a fast name check. Steve Trevor. Jane Foster. And these two are each heirs to a remote, scientifically advanced kingdom who have brief discussions with members of their species, and their powers are connected to nature. And these two heroes are awkward and uncomfortable in a group setting. I, I understood that reference. I need friends. I'm just trying to point out that all of these heroes fulfill similar roles in each film. As the villain attacks various locations, he slowly draws more heroes into the fight. Some of these heroes unite for the first time to free hostages, but afterwards they meet at their temporary headquarters and disagree on how best to face this threat. Now, around this time, one of their most powerful heroes goes off the deep end and they have to fight him. Afterwards, two of the heroes go to a peaceful field to gather their thoughts. Each film features a variety of supporting cast members, including one of the hero's red-headed love interests. The heroes figure out where the villain is and they arrive in time to fight flying aliens. Our focus is drawn to innocent female bystanders who have a personal interaction with the heroes. In this final fight, the heroes finally work together and then they pose majestically. During the fight, the non-powered heroes perch on a ledge and pick off the bad guys. The overpowered hero shows up and easily defeats the villain, but to stop the invasion, they have to break up the cube's energy flow. After their victory, a supporting cast member narrates while the heroes go back to their individual lives. The billionaire hero teases the creation of a new headquarters for the team. And there are two post credit scenes. One sets up the next villain and the other is more comedic. And Zack Snyder's original script ended by introducing Darkseid, like how Avengers teases Thanos, another craggly chin bad guy from space. So those are the similarities. Now let's break down the scenes that I think define these movies. First, the Avengers. Everyone remembers this shot, the shot. When Earth's mightiest heroes stand back to back, ready to fight off an invading armada, when they are united for the first time. But this is not the most important scene in this movie. Anyone can pose their characters together. I mean, Fant Forstick did it. This scene is only possible because up until now, the Avengers didn't work together. In fact, they didn't even like each other. It's like the most dysfunctional family you'd ever meet. They come into this group and think, we don't fit together, you know? This moment means something because the characters had to overcome an emotional hurdle to achieve it. So what is the most crucial scene in the movie? The argument. This is the midpoint of the film, the hero's lowest point. It's set in Tony and Bruce's lab. It's a large set, almost like a theater stage. It begins with the revelation that S.H.I.E.L.D. is making Hydra weapons. Phase two is S.H.I.E.L.D. uses the cube to make weapons. There are so many small, great character moments in this scene, like the antiquated Steve saying, Sorry, the computer was moving a little slow for me. Everyone has a comeback. The dialogue flows easily. You had to come up with a nuclear something. deterrent, because that always calms everything right down. 
Remind me again how you made your fortune start. Joss Whedon created ensemble shows like Buffy and Firefly, and he knows how to manage a cast with distinct voices. When Banner point blank asks why S.H.I.E.L.D. is making weapons, we get a twist answer. Because of him. Me. Now this makes us consider events of the Thor film from a different human perspective. Now this scene becomes about the role of heroes in a human society. Can we rely on them to save us? Or should humans be able to save ourselves? This movie is about the Avengers answering that question. Are they worthy to be our protectors? The epic tracking shot during the Chitauri invasion gets all the attention, but it has a forerunner in this scene. The camera easily glides past these characters as they each contribute to this conflict. And this scene was not easy to film. Just listen to Joss Whedon talk about how hard it was. This is the day that I have dreaded the most uh, since I wrote the script. Uh, I have all of the principal characters except for Jeremy Renner. What for these people want to take you down? Writing the scene was, was horrifically difficult, but more importantly, shooting it is it seems next to impossible. Wait, so, I Notice how the camera gradually tilts, giving us the unsettling feeling that this whole team is about to collapse before they even form, until eventually the camera lifts above the scepter and shows us the scene upside down, hinting that Loki is actually manipulating them into having this argument. Now there's a brief cutaway to Hawkeye getting ready to blow the helicarrier's engines, and when we come back, the heroes are close to blows. The score begins an eerie shriek, like a slasher film. Bruce even just says that they are not a team. We're a chemical mixture that makes chaos. We're, we're a time bomb. And then Steve and Tony's personal differences come bubbling to the surface, laying the groundwork for the next several films. Put on the suit. Let's go a few rounds. Sometimes I want to punch you in your perfect teeth. Their argument raises the question, is Tony willing to sacrifice his life? You're not the guy to make the sacrifice play. The only thing you really fight for is yourself. This question will need to be answered in the third act. We cut to a low angle shot of Thor to show that he sees himself as above this fray. <laughs> you people are so petty and tiny. And then Bruce just blurts out that he attempted suicide. I put a bullet in my mouth and the other guy spit it out. These are not stable people. They don't get along, they don't trust each other, and they're about to come to blows. This scene defines the Avengers. It gives them something to overcome. Put on the suit. Yep. This is our assistant manager, Doug. Doug, what was it you said about that scene that was so interesting? I don't really agree with your analysis, but if you agree with Doug, let us know in the comments below. Okay, so now let's talk about Justice League, which I had a heck of a time finding streaming online. I paid for all these different streaming sites and Justice League was not on a single one of them. And then I found out that it was on Netflix, but in the United Kingdom. <laughs> So instead of flying across the ocean to watch the movie, I got NordVPN, the sponsor of this week's video. NordVPN has thousands of super fast servers all over the world. So I was able to register my IP address from the United Kingdom and easily watch Justice League. So if you're interested, go to nordvpn.com slash screen crush to get 68% off a two year plan. And you can use the code screen crush at checkout to get another month for free. And if you find out the service isn't right for you, there's no pressure. There's a 30 day money back guarantee. Lots of streaming sites offer different programming in different countries. Using NordVPN is the best way to get your money's worth out of all your streaming services. Seriously, it's like adding free streaming sites on top of the ones that you're already paying for. Again, visit nordvpm.com slash screen crush or use the code screen crush to get your discount or click the link down in the description below. All right, so let's talk about Justice League's counterpoint to the Avengers scene. Avengers succeeds over Justice League because it's a movie about people overcoming their differences to become a team. Whereas Justice League is a film about it's actually really hard to tell what Justice League's about because it's more of a Frankenstein's monster of despair scene sewn together with the studio executive's wish list. It's alive. Oh, it's alive. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. Justice League's counterpoint to this Avenger scene is just after the heroes fight together for the first time. They've just freed Victor Stone and the other Star Lab scientists from Steppenwolf. The bad guy gets away and the heroes return to the Batcave to talk about what they're going to do next. Now, like in the Avengers, this scene takes place at the midpoint of the movie in the team's headquarters. But this isn't really a low point. I mean, the heroes just did a pretty good job. They saved the hostages, Barry gained some self-confidence, and they're all on the same page regarding stopping Steppenwolf. You gotta shut Steppenwolf down. 
they even have the space cube that he needs. They're actually in better shape than the Avengers were at this point. So let's break down this scene. Barry gets kind of a funny moment to act like a kid, and then Cyborg explains the mother box and his origin story. I was in an accident. Should have died. A mother box destroys as it creates. Then Bruce takes this information and goes on his own science monologue. What if you were stronger than a planet? Your cells lying dormant, but incapable of decay. That means a scientist. Now notice this isn't filmed with the same artistry as its complementary scene in The Avengers. It follows the film's school axiom. Shoot wide, shoot close, and get weird if there's time. The scene is mostly shot reverse shot, probably because this was all done in reshoots in front of a green screen. So visually, it doesn't slap. Then Bruce makes the argument to raise Superman from the dead. It's an amniotic chamber, which would be a perfect. No. They disagree. Bruce sees resurrection as a simple binary, on, off, alive or dead. But Diana discusses the moral implications and strikes a more spiritual tone. Technology is like any other power. Without reason, without heart, it destroys us. But then she directly calls out his reason for wanting resurrection. Because of your guilt? He name drops her dead boyfriend. Eve Trevor. She super shoves him, and he calls her out for not doing more to help people. Superman was a beacon. Why aren't you? Oh. Now, this is all valid, and people in the audience are wondering the same thing. Why did Diana disappear after the events of Wonder Woman? Remember, the Avengers scene centered around one question. Can these heroes come together? In this scene, the question is, should they resurrect Superman? Bruce's central argument is, We are not enough. I mean, they don't really know that because they did a pretty good job fighting Steppenwolf in the last scene, but anyway. Cyborg agrees with Bruce. I agree. Barry makes a pop culture reference. We mean bring him back in like a yay, he's back way, not in like a like a pet cemetery scenario. <laughs> now Arthur kind of disagrees, but doesn't really raise a fuss about it. You lose something when you die. Even Superman. Now then Bruce talks about having a contingency. I'll have a contingency plan for that. I guess he means kryptonite, but we never see it. And then the scene is over. So, if you're keeping track, in this scene, number one, Victor explains a mother box. Number two, Bruce wants to use it to bring back Superman. Number three, the team is divided on this point. And number four, okay. Okay. They do it anyways. What? Then <laughs> what was the point of them even disagreeing to begin with? This doesn't tell us anything about the characters. We don't see them interact. There's no tension, no release. It's just set up for bringing back Superman. And in the very next scene, Bruce and Diana work out their differences. So what was the point of the conflict? Diana raised some really good points. I mean, she's a god saying that these humans shouldn't play god. Are the heroes really so above humanity that they can rewrite the laws of nature? This is a very interesting interesting question for a superhero movie and it's completely ignored. And then Superman is evil when he comes back. Tell me, do you bleed? But only for about five minutes. So Diana's concerns were pointless and had no real consequences. In the Avengers, the team was distracted by infighting and this led to Loki's escape and Coulson's death. I mean, you know, consequences. But all of this is just a staging scene for Superman's resurrection and doesn't define the heroes, their relationships, or ask any questions that will need to be answered in the final act. There are no moral repercussions from the hero's decision to play God, no one is injured, and none of the themes of responsibility and godhood from the previous movies are revisited. The scene is all plot, no story. It's a thing that needs to happen so we can hurry up and get to the next thing that needs to happen so the movie can end. It's not a low point or an obstacle to overcome. This scene is a total loser. Sad. So what could the movie have done differently? Well, I have a suggestion. Now let's say during the fight in the sewers, the heroes are doing pretty good. The parademons are cannon fodder for Batman and Flash, while Cyborg and Wonder Woman are able to subdue Steppenwolf together. The audience is starting to think, hey, maybe the movie's gonna end after just an hour. But then Superman shows up in his black suit with a beard because in reshoots Henry Cavill famously had a mustache they had to blur it out it looked awful but it's easier to add a beard around a mustache than to digitally reconstruct an upper lip so Superman has a beard now but this bearded Superman is full mirror verse evil because Steppenwolf resurrected him to be a servant of Darkseid evil Superman easily defeats the heroes and they barely escape and maybe Cyborg's dad dies and he blames Barry for not saving him so there's a little you know dramatic tension brewing 
Now, this midpoint scene would play out very differently. They're scared and wondering how they can go on. Can they turn Superman good again? Can they use the last mother box to stop him? Can Bruce bring himself to fight Superman again with all the guilt he's carrying around from their last fight? This time, can he redeem Superman the way Superman redeemed him? Save Martha! If the point of this scene is for the Justice League to ask, are we enough? Then the answer should be, no, we're not enough. We're going to lose, but we're going to fight anyways. Now that's a hero's low point and the challenge they need to conquer in the final act. And maybe this is what happens in Zack Snyder's original version. I'm really glad we get to find out. I'm not a big fan of the Snyder movies, but I think a director should be able to fulfill his vision, and I'm excited to see the real version of this story be told. In fact, the end of the trailer for the Snyder Cut shows a portion of this scene. I don't care how many demons he's fought and how many hells, he's never fought us, not us united. And that already looks better than what we saw in 2017. Are you excited for the Snyder Cut? What do you think the DCEU should do next? Let me know in the comments below. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.